got to see things you've never seen before. And I can honestly say in the last five years, I've seen things with young people that I've never, ever dreamed of seeing before. I believe the Lord spoke to my heart about a year and a half ago and said that there were three things that the Lord is wanting to restore to the church through this generation. One was the worship. Um, God is wanting to teach his people how to worship again. Amen? Amen. The second thing is intercession. I have never in my life seen a group of teenagers or a generation of teenagers that intercede like this one right here. In fact, to remove your curiosity, what this is, this is not my snot rag. This is my intercessor cloth that my teenagers gave me for, for Christmas. And I think it's supposed to be a handkerchief. And I know I've got a big nose, but this is ridiculous. Um, and uh, my intercessors, we have about 50 teenagers that's in intercession right now um, in our intercessory team. And this is not just teenagers that meet for prayer meeting. These are teenagers that are hot after God. In fact, right now, either they're in the middle of or finishing a 40-day Daniel fast. They've given up all meats, sweets, everything but vegetables and fruits for 40 days. I tell you, I've never seen a generation like this one that knows how to pray. And they gave this to me for Christmas, and I don't know what to do with the thing. So I just wear it when I preach and pray, saying, God, I need help. You know what I'm saying? And, um, but uh, God is raising up a generation. Um, this is no exaggeration. You, if, by the way, we're going to have a youth service tomorrow night uh, across the street in the Family Life Center. And if we have any youth pastors or any of you that may be interested in seeing our young people in our service, uh, you're more than welcome to come. It starts at 7 o'clock. But at 6 o'clock, you can go over there, and I promise you, you will find dozens, possibly even over 100 teenagers there an hour early, seeking the face of God, interceding, believing God for a move of God. I've never in my life seen um, a generation like this one that knows how to pray. I'm talking, not talking, you know, just little pansy-wansy prayers. I'm talking on their face, weeping, crying, screaming out to God for a touch of God. The third thing the Lord, I felt like, said that he was going to restore to this generation is the prophetic. Um, listen, the church does not need any more professionals. They don't need any more politicians. What the church needs is prophets. The church needs some prophets with a word of God, with a thus saith the Lord. And um, I, God is doing that in this generation. God is doing something very unique. Um, We've had over 200 teenagers graduate in the last four years from this church. Uh, I just talked to my campus pastor this morning. We have another, catch this, Denise, 60, oh, that's not Denise, that's, um, that's my friend, um, ah, my mind name, my name just went blank. But anyway, we have, over, we have 61 high school seniors graduating this year. And um, I, I can show you by statistic, over the last four years, we've had over 200 teenagers graduate, not counting this graduating class. I can show you on paper that out of the teenagers that's graduated out of this church in the last four years, over 60% are now studying for full-time ministry. God is raising up a generation. I believe, listen, I, I do believe what Pastor uh, Dr. Brown preached this morning. I believe that we need a revolution. Anything short of that is not going to happen. You realize, I thank God for what he's doing at Brownsville, but do you realize what he's doing at Brownsville is not enough to shake our nation? The, 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 you hear me? If it was, it, we, we ain't even hit a drop in the bucket to this nation. We, listen, we're not going to change the nation by continuing to do what we're doing at Brownsville. We need something a lot bigger than that. We need something that just explodes the walls off of our churches. We need a revolution. And God's raising up a generation of radicals, a generation that's, that's just on fire for God, that's committing their whole life to Christ. And, and, and I, believe, I believe God's coming back for the church that is a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. I believe that. And if that's going to happen, there's going to have to be some radical changes in our churches. And I believe God's raising up a generation of hot on fire, preachers, men and women of God, that's going to shake this nation for Jesus. I just believe that with all my heart. Well, um, let me share with you, I'm real excited. Um, uh, I just had a book come out. How many of you, how many of you have to take up an offering every week at your church? Yeah. Uh, some of you are senior pastors, you're, you don't blessed with that. But um, I'm, I'm a youth pastor here, so I get to take up the offering every Sunday. I remember when pastor called me. Um, to the staff seven and a half years ago. He said, Richard, can you take an offering? 
I said, I don't know, Pastor, I'll try. And I've been taking the offerings on Sunday morning every, every Sunday since then. And um, a Pastor always wants some teaching. You know, he said, teach before you take the offering. You know, give us, give us some nuggets. And friend, I have dug and dug and dug. There's not very many nuggets out there in the, in the bookstore. You know, I've looked in her, you know, I look for stuff on offerings. It's just not stuff. And, uh, but about three or four years ago, I had some people in the congregation go, Brother Richard, do you keep all the stuff that you teach and all the quibs and the quotes and the statistics and all that? And I said, no. They said, you ought to. And so for the last three years, I've been keeping uh, quotes, uh, illustrations, poems, statistics, um, just uh, a whole bunch of things. And, um, and the book just came out. If you, if you would like to have a good book, a resource book, to help you take up offerings, um, this book, I got, just got 25 copies is all I got. I'm telling you, it just came out. The rest of them will be in this afternoon. But um, it's called Kingdoms of Principles for Finance, Turning Your Finances into a Fragrance of Worship. But one of the reasons why, in fact, the last thing I put in this book was a statistic by George Barnum, and it just came out three or four weeks ago, and it said this. This will blow your socks off. In a recent survey by George Barnum, 23% of born-again Christians buy a lottery ticket on a typical week. 23% buy a lottery ticket on any typical week. Born again Christians, it gets worse. 37% of adults who attend church did not give any money to the church in the previous year. It gets worse. Only 3 to 5% of people who donate money to the church actually tithe. That's his recent statistic, okay? The reason is, a large reason is, is because we don't teach on the tithing. And we're robbing our people, and we're letting them be cursed because they're not giving the tithe. But anyway, there's a lot of teaching in here. There's, there's hundreds of stories, illustrations, poems. If you're interested in that, there's a few of them in the bookstore. Um, but just to let you know it's there, I'm so excited about that, that resource. And I um, want to let you know that that was available to you. On page 26, if you'll turn there, I want to pray, and then I want to bear my heart to you this, this afternoon. Holy Spirit, I thank you, Lord, for the honor and the privilege that you have given to me, Lord, to speak to these men and women of God. Lord, I recognize that I am not worthy. I recognize, Lord, that before me are men and women of much more experience, much greater influence. But, Lord, I come, Lord, as a vessel of honor today, and I ask that in my weakness that you would be strong. I ask, Father, that you would shake us up and stir us, Lord, and help us to recognize the need that we have for the power of God and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit in our services. Father, I ask that you, Lord, would shake us and change us by your Spirit. Father, I ask that you would mess us up today. In Jesus' name, amen. I um, had to give you my outline about two months ago. So I don't know how closely I'm going to stick to this thing. If you're a preacher, you know what I'm talking about. You know, you give an outline two months, and two months later, it's, it could be something totally different, but we'll go for it. <clears throat> we need to realize that we are living in a day, and we're working with a generation that is seeking and is hungry and desperate for the supernatural. I want you to just take a survey in your mind for a moment and think about the generation that we're dealing with. Do you realize that every teenager in my youth group right now has grown up watching cartoons that are nothing but about the supernatural? They did not watch Bugs Bunny and Roadrunner like you and me. They watched, they watched stuff like Ninja Turtles and Transformers. And then you have all the other, I don't even know uh, the names of all these cartoons, but almost every one of them are supernatural characters. Not only that, but now you go and even look in our evening TV, one of the hot, you know, you have all the science fiction movies and, and all the demonic movies that are coming out. And even in your short sitcoms, you're now having the superna uh, supernatural mixed in with it. We have a generation that is hungry for the supernatural. I personally believe that this is a setup of the Antichrist. 
I believe Jesus Christ is coming back very soon. And I believe that this is a setup of the Antichrist, that when the Antichrist arrives on the scene, remember how he is going to deceive the multitudes? is through the supernatural. I believe that it's all a setup by the Antichrist. But how many of you believe, how many of you know that God can take that which the devil has meant for bad and turn it for good? There is such a hunger and a craving in this generation for the supernatural. Why are so many of them turning to satanic worship? Why can you turn on your TV practically any hour of the day and you can see commercials, some of them 30-minute um, programs on calling psychic numbers and, 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 and all this? It's because there is a craving in this generation especially for the supernatural. And let me tell you something, church. Let me tell you, men and women of God, this generation does not want our church services. They do not want our programs. They don't even want our great worship teams. They don't even want our great dramas. What they want and what they desperately need is the power of God in demonstration. My worship team knows that I am not interested in good music. In fact, I remember it's been about a year and a half ago now, whenever they were getting ready to put out their first CD. Our, our youth worship team has two CDs out now. And right before they were putting out their very first one, they were green behind the ears and they were, you know, they, they didn't know what they were doing. And they were so concerned about having the music, you know, musicians, you'll know, you'll understand this term. I don't understand it. They call it tight, whatever that means. But they want their music tight. You know, they want it, they want it to sound good. And now I remember one youth service uh, just about a month before our conference when they were recording. We had, we had probably a thousand teenagers in our youth service and, and, the, and the music was great and the teenagers are down there bouncing and, and going in and just having themselves a great time. And everybody was just, oh, they were just in heaven, they thought. But I was, I was back in the back of the sanctuary. I was back in the back of the platform, and I was pacing just like this. I felt like a cat in a dog pound. I was not comfortable. You know why? Because the presence of God was not there. All we had was good music. All we had was hype. Hello. And we ever heard that term in the church. We had hype. We had all this junk, but God wasn't there. And after about 30 minutes, I'm doing this. I'm sitting there going, God, I'm not taking the microphone till you move. I'm, I, and I'm sitting there going, and after about 30 minutes of praying and just nothing was happening, I grabbed the microphone and I talked to the young people and the presence of God began to fall in that place as we began to worship God. After the service, I snatched my worship team up to the back of the platform, to the back room, and I, and I stuck my finger in their face. I said, fellas... What you did tonight will never happen again. Do you understand me? And they're all looking at me dumbfounded. And I said, we are not here to have good music or a cute sermon. If we have anything less than the presence of God, we have failed. We're no different than the bar down the road. They have their bands and their stand-up comedians. Moses said in Exodus chapter 33, he said, the only thing that extinguishes and distinguishes us from everybody else on the face of the earth is the presence of God. My sermons, your sermons aren't going to change anybody's life. No music is going to change anybody's life. It's only by the powerful presence of the Holy Ghost that people's lives are going to be changed. And I am hungry. I am searching for the supernatural. I want to know where it's at. I thank God for things that are happening, okay? And I'm going to make some balancing statements, but I'm like pastor. I don't believe in balance. In fact, let me share with you something. If you're balanced, you're not going anywhere. Think about it. I'm balanced. I want to move. I can't move. I can't move. I cannot walk until I first get out of balance. Then I can go somewhere. Hello. As long as we're concerned about balance, friend, you're going to be in the same rut you're in. <laughs> Ten years from now, we got we got to get moving. And I, I'm personally on search for the supernatural. Well, I want you, uh, let me let me just start my notes. We'll see where we go. Mark chapter nine, verse fourteen. If you want, you can follow in your notes. It says this, and when they that's Jesus and some of these disciples, a couple of his disciples. This is when Jesus came down, I believe, from the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. In Mark 9, 14, it says, When they came to the other disciples, they say, saw a large crowd around them. 
And I can imagine this, uh, Peter, James, and John going, oh, praise God. Oh, there's something going on now. There's more miracles taking place because they're used to seeing big crowds around miracles. It says that there was a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. And as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. Now I want you to catch the picture here. Jesus, Peter, James, and John are coming down from the trans Mount's Transfiguration. They come, there's a big crowd around the disciples and some of the uh, religious leaders, and they're arguing. The crowd is watching them argue. All of a sudden, somebody in the crowd turns around, they see Jesus, they go, Jesus! And the whole crowd leaves them and comes to Jesus. You with me? Listen to me. In your notes, you can jot it down. Today, people are watching our religious leaders argue about doctrinal issues when all they really want is Jesus. Too many times they're sitting there wondering, they're not wanting anything to do with our churches because all we do is argue. And all they want is Jesus. And the moment they saw Jesus, they left the argument and ran to his feet. Verse 16, what are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robed, uh, robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Listen to me. Because we do not have the power of God to perform miracles, we too have turned to arguing over doctrinal issues. Verse 19, Jesus said, Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long should I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And so they brought him, and when the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. And he fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. And it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do something, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And look what Jesus said. If I can, what kind of question is that? If I can. Listen to me, men and women of God. You realize that because of our lack of power and lack of anointing to do miracles, People doubt the power of God in their lives. Why did this man doubt that Jesus could perform? Because, he, because his disciples already couldn't do it. Because his disciples couldn't do it, he began to even doubt if Jesus could do it. And Jesus said, whoa, 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 whoa. If I can. If I can, Jesus said, everything is possible to him who believes. And immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirits. You deaf and dumb spirit, he said, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. And the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. And the boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. And after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive him out? And he replied, this kind can come out only by prayer, and the King James says, and fasting. And it makes me mad that my NIV doesn't say, and fasting. Two times the King James says, such prayer things happen by prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. Listen to me, I'm telling you, this generation is ready for this kind of stuff. I just share with you, this church talks a lot about raising the dead, about opening eyes, about raising people out of the wheelchairs, about deaf people hearing. And I'm so glad that I'm a part of a church like that. But listen to me, you're looking at a man, I'm sick and tired of us talking about it. I'm ready to start doing it. Our problem is this, we, we feel satisfied because we talk about it. I wanna know, what are we doing about it? I'm ready to start doing something about it. In fact, listen to me, I'm not pulling punches with you. I started this year with a 40-day fast. I lost 30 pounds. I used to weigh 185, and now I weigh 160. 
40 day fast. Why? I don't know why. I just want something to happen. And I know that if I don't do something different, then this year is going to be just like last year. And I don't want this year to be just like last year. See, we can come to our conferences and we can get hyped and all that. But I want to know what are we going to do different when we go back home? I don't know, listen to me, I don't know what it takes to make, see the supernatural, but I am sure grabbing for straws and I'm sure trying some things until I have hit the key. About the, about the 19th day into my fast, all of a sudden I'm getting desperate, friend. And I told my young people, I said, young people, we're after a search. Our theme this year in our youth ministry is reaching the lost with the supernatural. And trust me, friend, it's working. Reaching the lost with the supernatural. And I said, young people, the reason why God doesn't do miracles, is not doing any miracles, is because we're not giving them any chances. I said, right now I declare, two weeks from today, we're having a miracle night. I didn't know what in the world I was doing. Hello. It's a miracle night, two weeks. Made one announcement. You know, usually that's when God moves is when you don't know what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? I said, two weeks, miracle night. Don't know what we're going to do. The next week, I said, young people, this week, we have too much garbage going into our eyes. Do you realize the average teenager today watches 26 hours of TV? If you add computers to that, over 48 hours of media. They don't know what reality is because they're never in reality. 48 hours, that's more than a full-time job. No wonder we don't see a move of God. We have too much garbage into our spirit. And I said, young people, this week, I don't want anybody to turn on their computer. I don't want anybody to turn on their TV. I said, not only that, but I want to challenge everyone that will to fast three days. Three complete days. We're going to fast Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, going into Miracle Night. We didn't advertise Miracle Night at all. I just made one announcement on news service one Thursday night. Two weeks later, we had over 200 guests that came just because it was Miracle Night. We had blind eyes. We had, we had blinded people. We had deaf people. We had cripples there. I had one, I had one uh, adult in our church come up to me. I don't know how she found out because I didn't announce it. I didn't do anything on Sunday. This was just one Thursday night. And she came up to me. She said, Brother Richard, she said, my next door neighbor doesn't believe in God and they hate our church, but he's bringing his da blind daughter to your youth service tomorrow night. I was thinking, dear Jesus. <laughs> How many of you realize people are ready for this kind of stuff? They are ready for this kind of stuff. And I'm sad to say that that night we did not see a blind eye open. We didn't see an ear open, okay? We didn't see any of that. But let me tell you what we did see. We'd had, we've had miracle reports since then come back, okay? And, and some wonderful miracle reports. And listen, we're seeing trinkles of stuff. At Brownsville, we're seeing stuff. We're, we're having people come back. They were, they were eat up with cancer. And we'll, we'll get back our doctor's report a couple months later that they're completely healed and all that. We're seeing that. But I, listen, friend, I'm ready to see it on a more consistent basis. I'm ready to see it on a more consistent basis. And I'm searching. I'm sitting there going, God, why? Why? And I remember that night. I remember the night of our miracle night. I stood up in front of my teenagers. And, and that very day, it was around day 33 for me, I think it was, in my fast that very day, that, the day before, the Lord began to, to share some things with me, and I want to share some things with you today. He said, Richard, he said, um, he said, why do you want to see the miraculous? Why? Why do you want to see the miraculous? Because I'm on this search. He said, why do you want to see the miraculous? I said, God, I want, you know, there are blinded people out there. He says, does it really grieve you that they're blind? Or do you just want to have the power to be able to go, be healed, and then go tell everybody that you saw somebody's eyes open? He said, Richard, I couldn't use you to, to do miraculous because you have too much ego and self inside of you. And then he said this, and he said, if you don't die to yourself, there will be people that will die blind because I couldn't use you. And he said, Richard, he said, don't forget. He said, John the Baptist, Jesus said, John the Baptist was the greatest born, greatest men, uh, men of God born among women. Did he not say that? Yet in John chapter 10, verse 41, Jesus said this. He said, John the Baptist performed no miracles. He said, now I said he's the greatest among men, but he didn't perform the first miracle. He said, Enoch, Enoch, the Bible says that Enoch walked with God. In fact, Enoch walked with God for 300 years. Tell me one miracle he did, besides being taken up in the chair. That's, that's pretty big, you know what I'm saying? But I mean, while he was on earth, what did he do? 
Abraham, known as a friend of God. Known as a friend of God. Name and miracle. And he said, Richard, he said, go on your search because I'm wanting to pour out my spirit. I'm wanting to demonstrate myself. But he said, don't forget that I am the one that you're really after. And I remember I stood in front of my teenagers that night and I said, young people, listen to me. I said, and I shared with them that, and I said, I want to ask you a question. No hype. I was sitting on a stool. I said, no hype, no religious talk. We're sick and tired. Let's stop this stuff, okay? And I asked them, I said, how many of you turned off the TV, the computer this entire week? Hundreds of hands raised, at least 300 hands. I said, how many of you, I'm not going to ask how long you fasted, because I had some kids fasting a whole week. I said, how many of you have fasted? for Miracle Night. Again, hundreds of hands raised. I said, okay, I said, now no hype, no hype. I want to ask you this question. If you know your heart, and none of us do, we all don't know, we don't know our heart, we're wicked. But the best that you know of yourself, if you know your heart, can you honestly say, no hype, can you honestly say that if you know your heart, you think you love God more tonight than you've ever loved Him? Almost every hand in the place went up. I just started crying. I said, guys, I'm a happy man. I really don't give a rip if I see a blinded eye open tonight. And I said, that's not a cop eye. Then I said this. By the way, the Lord showed me something. The Lord showed me that we've been seeing the miraculous all along. The Bible says that he will confirm his word with signs and miracles, correct? Now, if you're preaching a message of salvation and holiness, what would be the sign or the miracle to confirm that word? Salvation and holiness. I said, listen to me, around this church, good lands of the holiness messages that have been preached across that pulpit. The salvation messages have been pre preached across that pulpit. I said, we've been seeing it all along. God's been confirming his word all along. I said, the reason why we're not seeing healing is because we're not preaching about it enough. I said, now I'm going to preach on healing. And I preached for about 30 minutes on healing. And as I said that night, we didn't see the blind eyes open that night, that night. But we have had numerous testimonies come in, bona fide, um, documented miracles that were taking place in that service. What I'm saying is this, I'm on the search for the miraculous, and this generation is ready for it. I, had, I, I do youth pastor conferences once a month, and uh, I've had some youth pastors ask me recently, they said, what do you feel like the youth ministry is going to look like going into the 21st century? I said, I answer it this way. Youth groups will always look the way they've always looked like. But I believe youth ministries are going to begin to move into the supernatural. Youth groups will stay the same, but youth ministries will move into the supernatural. I just believe that with all my heart. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you uh, the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. I believe that we, when we begin to move into the supernatural, it's going to be when we get weak, fearful, and trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You can jot it down. Listen to me. Because we no longer have the demonstration of the Spirit and of power in our ministries, we, as men and women of God, have had to revert back to using enticing words of man's wisdom. And we all are masters at it. We all are. We know how to do, to do our sermon so that we end the sermon with a sad story. And isn't it interesting that the musician always comes at the end of the sermon and they, and they know exactly the right keys to play. And the music begins to stir the hearts of the people. And we get in our pulpits and we go, do you feel that? They go, yeah, I feel that. That's the Holy Ghost dealing with you. Oh, it must be. I'm in church. I can feel it. And we call altar calls and they come running down here to the altars and they cry their eyes out. Oh, God. Oh, God. 
and then we have to beg him to come to church next week. You know why? Because the Holy Ghost had nothing to do with it. Listen to me. I'm a crybaby and I'm proud of it, okay? And, and listen, uh, my, my daughter's favorite program is Little House on the Prairie. Isn't that music anointed, friend? I'm telling you, I can, I, this has happened to me on numerous occasions. I'll come into the house and they'll be watching a Little House on the Prairie video, you know, and at the end of the program, they always play that music, you know what I'm saying? I can come in, I don't even know I have the foggiest idea what the program's about. When that music strikes, I start crying. Oh, God, I know that was good. That was good. <laughs> Can I tell you something? There are certain types of music that will stir the heart, and the Holy Ghost doesn't even have to be in it. You can share your sad stories, you can play your music, and you can get people at the altar, altar for an altar call, but that doesn't mean the Holy Ghost has changed their life. You know what that is? That's enticing words of men's wisdom. And I'm not against that. We obviously, hey, around this place, we obviously use music altar calls, okay? Come running, you know what I'm saying? But, but listen, I'm not against that. But what I'm saying is this, is too many times we have leaned upon that to move hearts of people to come down here that the Holy Ghost has nothing to do with. Listen to what, listen to what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 1.5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance that you may know that your man, excuse me, so as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. You can jot it down. The gospel, my friend, is much more than just words about the good news. It is the power of God into salvation. And that means complete deliverance. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So my big question is this, where's the supernatural? Why are we not seeing more than what we are seeing? I really have a beef with this. I'm really having a problem with this. And my young people and I are doing some gut-wrenching searching questions. The reason we don't have answers is because we don't have enough guts to ask the right questions. So I've been asking, why don't we see the supernatural? What's missing? And there's several possible answers, and I'm not going to share with you the key, because obviously I don't have it yet. I'm not doing it yet. But I'm, I want to share with you something the Lord showed me. What are some possible answers? Well, some of the possible answers could be that there's a lack of faith and prayer. That's obvious. Lack of faith and prayer. And I emphasize, and prayer. We don't pray. We don't believe in prayer. If we really believed in prayer, we'd pray more, including the man talking to you right now. There's a lack of holiness and purity. Possibly it's complacency and apathy. All these could be reasons, as well as many others. But let me share with you the thing the Lord showed me during my fast. And I know there's others of you who have gone an extended fast. I, this is the, that was the very first time I ever did a 40-day fast. I've done some 21 days, and, and uh, I just knew, listen, I, I'm just going to just, I just knew that if I went on this 40-day fast that God was going to give me great revelations. Let me tell you, most of the time during this fast, I didn't even think I was saved. I mean, I'm telling you, I'm sitting there going, God, I just want food, you know, just forget you, Jesus. I mean, I'd read the Word, and it was as dead during those 40 days that I've ever read in my life. It was dead. All God showed me was my junk. I mean, he showed me so much junk about myself. I'm sitting there going, dear Jesus, why do you even put up with me? I mean, I, I'm a wretched sinner. You know what I mean? And um, here's, what the Lord, here's what the Lord showed me. He said, Richard, one of the reasons why I cannot move in, in many, many ministries is because of wrong motives. Wrong motives. Not lack of faith. Not lack of desire. Not lack of holiness, maybe not even lack of, uh, not, maybe not even because of complacency of apathy. But God said, if you're ever going to see the supernatural, you're going to have to get the heart of God. You're going to have to get the right motive. Because listen to me, you can fill in your blanks. We can pray, preachers, we can pray biblical prayers from hearts that are full of faith. Biblical prayers from a heart that is full of faith. But if our motives are wrong, God will not answer that prayer. I have stood before my teenagers many times 
and told them a statement something like this. Young people, you can pray for your daddy's salvation and God not hear that prayer. And some of them, they'll look at me dumbfounded and I'll go, let me tell you how come. Because your daddy's an alcoholic. And when dad's an alcoholic, he comes home and he cusses you out and he beats your mama. And you can't stand it. And you go to prayer and you go, God, please, please, God. Say, my daddy, I can't live this way anymore, God. My house is a hellhole. I can't stand going home. My life's miserable, God. But you just say, my daddy. I said, God doesn't answer that prayer. You know why? Because it's a selfish, egotistical prayer. You're not concerned about daddy going to hell. You're concerned about your own comfort. And God can't answer that prayer. He can't answer it, my friend. It's in your, it's in your notes. James 4.1. What, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that, uh, that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. You ask because of selfishness, so because of ego. The Lord said, Richard, I can't use you because you're so stinking egotistical. You're so stuck on yourself. Most people that are around me, they go, Brother Richard, how do you stay so humble? They don't understand. I'm not humble. I'm insecure. <laughs> it's the truth. But I hide my insecurity in humility because, see, insecurity is not spiritual. But humility is so spiritual. And people go, Richard, you're the youth pastor in Brownsville Assembly. How do you stay so humble? I got a problem. Trust me, friend. I do not have a problem with humility. God always has a way of hum humbling me. You know what I mean? Not too long ago, I went and spoke at a conference on the other side of the nation. And, uh, and God, God, I guess, thought I needed some humbling. The church sent the church janitor to pick me up from the airport. I literally had to move the toilet plunger out of my seat to sit down. <laughs> Big man of power here. You know what I'm saying? Humility is not my problem. But God said, he said, Richard, I couldn't use you because you get on the plane in the next conference, you'd tell everybody about, hear me? And he said, until you get your motive right, it's never going to happen. I want to ask you, pastor, I want to ask you, evangelist, I want to ask you, what motivates you? Why do you do the things you do? Why do you do it? You know what? Many of us, if we be honest, many of us love our position because we love the pats on the backs. We love people telling us how wonderful we are. We love people telling us how our city is blessed to have us. How do I know that? Because I'm one of you. We love that. And that's the reason why we have to fight being men pleasers, because we want the praises of men. It's the truth. I can't remember who it was. But one great man of God said, I've, oh, I know who it was. It was uh, Reinhard Barnke. He said, he said um, criticism doesn't bother me anymore because I've learned not to let praise bother me anymore. See, we, you know, I, I always remember something that one of my, my previous pastors told me. He said, he said, Richard, always remember you're never as good as they say you are and you're never as bad as they say you are. You're somewhere in the middle. I said, thank you, Jesus. You know? but, said, but listen, we, we, why do you do the things you do? Why? Listen, in this church, in the school of ministry, we can say, the day is coming when the blinded eyes are going to open. And everybody goes, Wah! we're going to see the dead rise. Wah! So they're going, why do we get so emotionally excited about that? Why? What's our motive behind that? So we can say, we go to that church? Oh, we saw this? What's our motive? What was Christ's motive? On the 39th day, I read through the entire Testament that day, New Testament, and I saw something I never saw before. And I saw that Jesus operated differently than we do. First of all, I want you to jot down in your notes. Our motives are much more important than our actions. I tell my young people this all the time. You realize that there are missionaries out on the field right now that have no business being on the mission field. That they were in one of our church services, and we had a missionary speak. He maybe showed a video presentation. And, and they were young, vibrant young man. 
And he heard people around him going, ooh, ah, what a man of God. Ooh, ah, what a sacrifice they have made for God. And they sat there and they went, oh, I want people to say that about me. And they answered the call to missions. And they're out on the mission field today, and they're not supposed to be there. I believe our motives are much more important than our actions. In 1 Chronicles 28, 9, an uh, 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 underlined portion, it says, For the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. Why, why am I speaking to you today? Why did I pick this message? You know, all those things. I, I ask myself those questions all the time. Why do I do the things I do? Why do you do the things you do? And when I read through the Gospels this last time, um, not this last time, when it, the, uh, a couple of months ago when I read through the Gospels, I saw something about Jesus that I never saw before, and that is I think that I saw his motive behind every one of his miracles. And I want to share it with you. <clears throat> Uh, my notes are all, let, let me see. Tell you what, before I go there, let me back up, okay? Again, I, I told you it's been a couple of months since I should, should put down these notes. <clears throat> let me just make this statement. There, the bottom of page 27. What we're dealing with tonight, today, men and women of God, is something that's always been around, okay? There have always been those who were in ministry with the wrong motives, when Paul was writing to the Philippian church, I'm not going to read the entire section here, okay? But look down at the very bottom. In verse 18, he said, but what does it matter? He said, some preach for good reasons, some preach for bad reasons. Verse 18, he says, but what does it matter? It is what is important is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. See, even in Paul's day, there were men and women of God who were preaching, or men and women preaching the gospel in the ministry for the wrong motive. Even in Paul's day, and it's the same today. See, we don't want to admit this, men and women of God, but this is the truth. Most of us are very selfish and egotistical. And you can jot that down if you want to or not. Most of us are selfish and egotistical, and I'm talking to you from me, okay? I'm just, you know, I'm making an assumption here, and that is that many of you are a lot like me. And I'm just telling you, I'm telling you, I'm being gut straight and honest with you. We're selfish and egotistical. And this is not just something today either. In Mark chapter 10, this is a very sad portion of Scripture to me. In Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 32, Jesus is with his disciples. He's with his best friends. And he, he's, about, he's about to be crucified. We, we, we celebrated the, the crucifixion, the resurrection this last Sunday. He's about to be crucified. He's sitting down with his best friends. And he starts sharing with them. Men, listen to me. I'm about to be crucified. We're going to go to Jerusalem in just a day or two. And, and they're going to they're put me in chains. They're going to beat my back. They're going to batter me. They're going to mock me. They're going to ridicule me. They're going to crucify me. He's sitting there, and, and, and he's wanting his disciples to understand what he's about to go through. He's, he's being point blank with them. Read it with me. Verse 32. They were on their way to Jerusalem, and Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. And again, he took the twelve aside, and he told them what was about to happen and what was going to happen to him. And this is what he said. We're going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, kill him, and three days he will rise. Now stop there. You understand what's going on here? Jesus is sitting with his disciples, and he's overcome. In fact, if you read this account in John, I think it's chapter 12, Jesus stops right in the middle of, of this teaching with his disciples, and he stops and he says, my soul trembles. He was overcome with anguish as he began to think about what he was about to go through. I want you to catch this picture. He's sitting down with his best friends, and he's saying, guys, I want you to understand what I'm about to go through. I'm about to be beat for you. I'm about to be mocked for you. 
I'm about to be ridiculed for you. They're going to they're gonna beat me. They're going to they're gonna pull my, 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 my facial hair. They're going to crucify me. I'm going to die for you, but it's okay. Three days later, I'm going to rise again. I'm going to do that for you. I'm doing it for you. I want you to understand that. And I need you to understand that because I need you to be praying for me. I need you to be there for me. Do you understand me? I need you to be there for me. I'm doing this for you. And as Jesus is trying to unbear his soul to these disciples, as he's sharing with them what he is about to go through, the anguish and the pain that he's about to go through for them, as he's in the middle of this, look at one of what his disciples do. Verse 35. Then James and John, the son of Jebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Whoa! Do you see what's happening here? Jesus is sitting down with his disciples and he's saying, Guys, I need you to be there. I need you to pray for me. I'm about to die. I'm about to be crucified. I'm about to be mocked. And his disciples are sitting around and they're going, Well, I wonder who's going to be in charge after he leaves. <laughs> Jesus, that's nice, Jesus. Uh, stop right there, Jesus. Uh, could you do for us whatever we want? If that is not selfishness and egotistical from the very disciples that Jesus spoke. You know what? Think about your prayer life. Most of our prayer life is nothing more than us coming before God, going, God, Jesus, would you do for me whatever I ask? Lord, would you touch this one and this one and this one and this one and do this, Lord, and touch my church and bless me, Lord. Give me a message. Oh, God, please, God, please, God, please give me a message. And Jesus... Sometimes I wonder who's serving who around here. When's the last time we ever sat down and said, Jesus, I just want to love you today. Lord, I just want to love you. Lord, I don't, have, I don't want to ask anything from you today. Oh, Jesus, you've been so good to me. Lord, how could I ever? Oh, God, Jesus. Lord, I love you. Oh, by the way, ask whatever you want me to do for you. As if dying on the cross was not enough for them, they had the audacity to stop him and go up to Jesus. Would you do for us whatever we ask? Now, this is what blows me away. Jesus is so selfless and so giving. Look at his response. He go, they go, Jesus, would you do for us whatever we ask? Verse 36, what do you want me to do for you, he asked. Now, I don't know about you, but I am, I am the sinking, wretched sinner. You know what I'm saying? If I'm sitting down with my best buddies... And I'm, about, I'm telling them, I'm going to go through all this for you. And then they stop and go, oh, well, that's good, Richard. But, uh, oh, could we have your car? <laughs> I would probably come back with, you sorry, stinking, rotten, no good scums. That's what I would do. Now, I know you're a lot more spiritual than I am. I'm just talking about me. <laughs> Jesus, no. Jesus goes, Phew. You know, these guys, they'll never get it. He goes, all right, what do you want me to do for you? He asks, and they reply, let one of us sit on your right and the other on your left in your glory. <laughs> Who gives about the crucifixion? Just go do what you need to do. Would you just make sure we can sit on your right and left? And Jesus goes, listen to what he said, you do not know what you're asking. You know what? I think that many times we ask God for things and we don't even know what we're asking for. I remember whenever I was uh, first called to the ministry, man, I just wanted to be a man of God. You know, I just, I wanted to shake this world. Man, I was going to, one-handed, I mean, just single-handedly, I was going to shake this world for Jesus, you know. God, I want to be a man of God! And he's going, you are so stupid. You're just like everybody else. You don't even know what you're asking. Because how many of you realize that if we're going to see something radical, it's going to take a sacrifice? And listen, I don't know. I've told my young people, I don't know if I am willing to pay the price to see a move of God. I don't know if I'm willing to do that. But I'm praying to God that if I talk about it enough, somebody in my ranks is going to pay the price. Somebody will be willing to drink of the cup of pain. Somebody will be willing to do it. Jesus said... You don't even know what you're asking for. What I'm trying to say is this. We're selfish and egotistical. Even the disciples were selfish and egotistical. 
right in the midst of Jesus telling them about the crucifixion. Ooh, I need to move fast. Okay. What was Jesus' motive? I want to show you very quickly. I'm going to move fast, okay, so stay with me in my notes. Jesus was moved, was motivated by his compassionate love for the people who are hurting and in need. This is the bottom line. You know, I'm so, I'm so frustrated. I'm so frustrated, Richard. Great name. So frustrated because I just knew, I just knew that God was going to give me these great revelations if I would just fast. Great revelations. And all he kept bringing me back down to was how stinking rotten I was and how I need to love Jesus. I mean, that's what he just kept bringing me back to. Love Jesus, you're rotten. Love Jesus, you're rotten. Love Jesus, you're rotten. I'm sitting there going, hello, maybe I just need to love Jesus and I am rotten. I also read, if you want a great book, there's a book uh, by Richard Lardin. Somebody help me out. Uh, Larson, Lar Lairdin, Lairdin, God's Generals. Read the stinking book. It, not stinking book. It's a great book. Great book. Great book. Let me tell you the reason I love the book. Let me tell you the reason I love the book. He writes about all these great men and women of God in the 1800s, early 1900s, and he shares all the marvelous things that they did, the miraculous that they did, but he also shares the human side, their sins and their downfalls. And I'm sitting there, I'm reading through this book, and I, I've been reading Smith Wigglesworth and Charles Finney and, 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 and um, uh, Amy McPherson, and, and I'm, I'm just reading all these books about the, all these people, and I'm sitting there going, God, there's got to be a way that you can have a move of God without your family falling apart. There's got to be a way to have a move of God without you dying a premature death. You know, there's got to be a way. I believe it's the will of God. Hello. It's the truth. And, and I'm on the search, and I'm sitting there going, God, give us some answers. And I'm off, I'm off track again. I don't know where I'm at. Jesus was mood and motivated. Oh, here's where I was at. Here's where I was going. Here's where I was going. Here's where I was going. You know an observation I made? You know what an observation I made? And I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but that's okay. An observation I made when I'm reading all these 1800, early 1900 men of God, men and women of God who are doing great miracles. Here's an observation I made. As I'm reading their sermons and I'm watching what they're preaching on, you know what they're doing? They're preaching ABC gospel. I don't see them teaching on the deep things of deliverance. I don't see them doing the, you know, this great big deep teaching on the full armor of God and all this kind of stuff. I'm sitting there going, they're just, I'm telling you, it's the truth. Think about it. And they were doing the goods. Maybe because we're not doing the goods, we have to come up with a theology on how to do the goods. I don't know. But I'm sitting there thinking, let's just love God and be clean. You know what I'm saying? But look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Look what motivated him. Why did he do the miracles? I'm going to move fast if I can. Oh, Jesus, help me. Stretch this time, God. Stop the moon. Stop the sun. Well, that'd be a good one right there. Woo! Mark, Matthew 9, 35. Follow with me fast. And Jesus went about all cities and villages, teaching their synagogues, preaching the gospel, healing every sick and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion because they were faint. And he said, pray the Lord of the harvest that he sends forth laborers. In Matthew chapter 14, I want you to see the selflessness of Jesus and the compassion that he had for the people. In Mark, Matthew 14, 12, you see I have the heading there, John the Baptist's death. John the Baptist had been beheaded, okay? And in Matthew chapter 14, verse 12, it says this, And his disciples, Jesus' disciples, came and took up the body, that's John's body, and buried it and went and told Jesus. Now, remember, John the Baptist was Jesus' close cousin. As a matter of fact, he's the only cousin that we know his name. And Jesus and John were tight. And they, the disciples came to Jesus. They said, Jesus, your, your, your cousin John is dead. We just buried him. Now watch Jesus' response. Verse 13. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. Now why did Jesus do that? He was mourning. He was grieving. Jesus heard about his cousin being beheaded. He was close to him. He loved John. He got a ship. Every one of you have been in this situation. You lose a close loved one, you don't want to entertain guests. You want to get away by yourself, don't you? You just want to get away. You want to cry. You want to grieve. You want to go before the Father. This is what Jesus is doing. Jesus has lost his cousin. 
He gets in a ship, he goes to a deserted place, and when the people heard of it, they followed him on foot out of the city. Jesus had one problem, he could never be alone. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them and healed the sick. Can you imagine the selflessness? Jesus hears about his cousin being beheaded. He's hurting. He wants to get away from everybody. He goes and he finally gets over to a deserted place. He's down there crying. Oh, God, God, Jesus, God. He wasn't crying Jesus, was he? God, God. <laughs> he looks up. <laughs> That's what we cry. He looks up, and he looks up, and he's, he's wanting to be by himself. And what's he have? He has this crowd around him. And when Jesus looks up, he forgets all about himself. And he goes and he ministers to the people. Can I tell you, I'm not that way. When I'm hurting, when I'm burdened down and overloaded, and I see this kid that every time you turn around, he's on my shirt tail, and he's always got all these problems this long, and he really doesn't want an answer. He just wants to complain. And I see him, I don't go, I'm not moved with compassion toward him. I'm looking for the closest exit. And you know what I'm talking about. Look at me like you're just Mr. Holier than thou. But Jesus, here's the point. Jesus in the point of a low point in his own life. He's full of such love and such compassion for the people that he forgets about himself and, and God begins to use him to do the miraculous. The feeding of the 4,000, Matthew 5, 15. And Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude. Why did Jesus feed the 4,000? So he could prove that he was the bread of life? So that he could prove that he could do it? No, it wasn't to show his power, demonstrate himself. He was moved with compassion for the people. The healing of the two blind men, Matthew 20, verse 35, 30. They were shouting out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And in verse 34 it says, and Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes, and healed them. Every time you see the same words over and over, Jesus was moved with compassion. Healing of the leopard in Mark chapter 1, verse 40. It says that the, 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 the leper came and began to beseech him and they cry out to him. And Jesus in verse 41 says, he was moved with compassion. I love Luke 7, 12, the raising of the dead man. You know, now we've prayed for some dead people around here. We have. We've literally prayed for dead people around here. And um, I believe that if we keep doing it, we might get it right one day. But let me tell you something. Why did Jesus raise this, blind, this dead man? Was it to prove that he was the author of life? Was it to prove his power and demonstration? Look at why Jesus raised this blind, dead man. In, in Luke seven twelve, it says this, And when he came nigh to the gate of the city, Behold, there was a dead man carried out. Now notice the description. This dead man was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Now look here. I want you to catch the picture. Jesus comes. He comes across a funeral. There's a young dead man. Well, we, I say young. There's a dead man in the, in the coffin. Jesus assesses the situation. He knows exactly what's going on. The Bible says very clearly he's the only son and his mother is a widow. Now, many of you recall and know that in biblical days, whenever a, a woman's husband passed away, her sons were responsible to take care of her. Remember, even at Calvary. In fact, maybe somebody can tell me why Jesus did this. But Jesus was the firstborn of Mary. And at Calvary, again, he was not thinking about himself. He reaches, he looks down to his mother and he says, Mother, Behold your son, speaking of John the Beloved. Son, behold your mother. What was Jesus doing? He was taking care of his mama. Now, now here's, here's the question I have. Jesus had some brothers. Why weren't the brothers there taking care of mama? I don't know. I'm just, this is a question. But, needless to say, Jesus was taking care of business as the firstborn son. Okay? This woman's a widow. Her husband's gone. She only has one son. He's her only means of financial support. Jesus comes across this funeral. Not only that, but the woman's also 
obviously a godly and friendly woman because if you look at the next phrase, it says, and much people of the city was with her. So she was very popular. She was not, you know, some mean old lady. Okay? Jesus looks and he, he assesses the situation. He sees that there's this widow, her only son, her only means of support. She's a, obviously a godly, friendly woman. And notice this, verse 13. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. Not on the man, but on her. Jesus raised this man out of the coffin, not to prove how powerful he was, but because he saw a woman in need. He saw her condition, and he was moved, the Bible says, with compassion and raised him from the dead. In fact, you can jot it down in your notes, even Jesus' most violent act was not done in a fit of rage, but was moved out of compassion for the people. One of my favorite stories of Jesus is there in your notes, and we'll look at it in just a moment, where Jesus goes into the temple with a whip. I love that story. I'm sitting there going, get on Jesus. You know what I'm saying? I love that story. I love that story. But I saw something in here that I've never seen before. Here's the way I've always visualized it before. Jesus is coming in, and you'll recall it's the triumphal entry, by the way, that this happens on, and I'll show you that in just a minute. It's the triumphal entry. He comes into Jerusalem. He walks into the temple, and I've always seen this. As Jesus walks in, he goes, ah! and he grabs something. And he starts driving people out. Ah! That's the way I've always seen it. Okay? Can I tell you it was not that way at all? It was not that way at all. Look, look in your notes. In Mark chapter 11, verse 9, it says this. Those who went ahead of, and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Father of uh, uh, David. Hosanna the highest. Okay? That's the triumphal entry. Now look at this. Verse 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Okay? Verse 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began to drive out those who were buying and selling. Okay? Now, do you understand and see this? It says that Jesus came in. He came in. He saw what was going on. He looked around. He said, oops, it's late. And he leaves. And he goes outside the town of Bethany. That's what it says, right? Now, what did he do when he was out there? Well, Luke tells you what he did while he was out there. Look at 19. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Luke 19, verse 38. Peace, you know, da, 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 okay, the triumphal entry. Verse 39. Some of the prof, uh, Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he said, if they, if they do, keep quiet, the rocks will cry out. Verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Here's what Jesus did. Here's what I believe Jesus did. He came in. He saw what was going on. He says, it's too late to deal with this today. He leaves. He goes out. He stands over that city that night, and he weeps over Jerusalem. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if only you had known your time of visitation. And he knew what he was going to do that next day. It was not a fit of rage. He was not caught off guard and just lost his temper. But, he, but as he's crying over how the people were being abused by the religious leaders of that day, and you know the story, how they would bring their lambs, and, and the lambs wouldn't, they would, they would look at the lamb and go, that's not good enough, you've got to buy one in the temple. And then they would make them go into the temple and buy a lamb, and, and they'd charge them outrageous amounts of money. Their sacrifices were hardly ever good enough. And they call, made them buy their sacrifices in the temple. And Jesus saw this. I believe he was moved with compassion for the people. He was moved at how they were being ripped apart by the religious leaders of their day. And he went in there and drove out those money changers out of compassion, not out of a fit of rage. The point that I'm making, leaders, is this. Jesus was moved. Jesus did everything out of a heart of compassion. And the Lord said to me, Richard, I, am really, I have really developed a burden. We have a young man. He's my age. His name's Russ. Russ, and he sits right over here, right next to where Pastor Robertson sits. And uh, he is a youth pastor. He was a youth pastor at a church in Tallahassee when he was struck with a tumor in the brain. And for the last 10 or 15 years, he's been in a wheelchair, cannot move. He sits right over there. And, and um, this year, especially for some reason, the Lord has really put a burden on my heart for Russ. 
And the Lord, the Lord said to me, the Lord said to me, Richard, he said, why do you want to see Russ come out of that chair? Why do you want to see the blinded eyes open? Why do I want to see a blind man in my church named Peter? Why do I want to see his eyes open? Do I want to see his eyes open because at that miracle service, he said, Richard, he said, I've been blind for 18, he said, I went blind when I was 18 years old. It was an accident, I think. He went blind when he was 18 years old. He said, Richard, I've never seen my wife. I've never seen my two kids. And his two kids are sitting there, beautiful kids. And the Lord said, why do you want to see his eyes open? Is it because you're moved with compassion, thinking about the fact that Peter may never see his family? Why do you want to see the deaf ears open? Is it because it hurts you? You're moved with compassion to think about going through life without sound. Why do you want to see Russ come out of that wear chair? Is it because you're moved with the thought of that you are called to preach the gospel? And, and who knows what's going on in his spirit as he's sitting here listening to preaching night after night after night. He probably has sermons that he's itching to preach, burning with a fire to preach, and he can't even hardly lift his head. Are you moved because of feeling what it would be like to be caged up and can't move? Does that move you? Or do you just want to be able to say, I laid hands and he rose. Jesus, I'm telling you leaders, Jesus was moved with compassion. And I don't know, I listen, I don't know all the answers to the supernatural, but I am convinced of this. Until we get right motives of why we want to see a move of God, we'll never see a move of God. And I'm saying, God, would you please, please rip out all the junk in my life and fill me, Lord, with the right motives, with the right love motive. Jesus. Let me give you the fill-ins. Number three, I need to finish in three minutes. Jesus was moved with compassion because he truly saw their needs. We don't see needs anymore. We really don't see them. Most of us have seen and heard about so much pain that we have become inoculated to it. We see it, but we are not touched by it. I have to confess to you that there have been more times than not that I'll come off Interstate 10 down, to, down the ramp, and at the end of the ramp, there'll be a man there that hasn't had a bath in three weeks. And he's sitting there, and you know the sign he's holding. We'll work for food. And I'll look over at him, and I won't say it out loud, but inside my spirit I'll go, no, you won't. I'm not even moved. Now I'm eating a lot of fruits and vegetables, and I always carry fruit with me. So when I see when I roll down my window and I hand them a piece of fruit, and I go, here you go. If they're really hungry, they'll eat it. But we see it all, we see it all the time. We, we see it on TV. We see it on the news so much. We can hear about murders and rapes and everything else, and we're not even grieved in our spirit unless we know them. And then we're grieved for a little while. But see, Jesus, when he saw it, it says that time and time again, you see this phrase, he saw and he was moved. He saw. Four. I need to move. Jesus was moved with compassion because he possessed the Father's heart. See, in 2 Corinthians and in James 5, 1, it, in both of those verses of Scripture describes the Lord as the Father of compassion or the Lord that was full of compassion. Jesus spent so much time with the Father that he, was, he had the Father's heart. We need the Father's heart. Can you say amen? amen? Number five, people were drawn to Jesus because they could tell that he had a genuine love and compassion for the people. I think it's a sad commentary that sinners were drawn to Jesus, but they're not drawn to our church. There's something wrong. There's something really wrong. Let me close by saying this. Can I say this, though, leaders? What we need is not just miracles in our services. Miracles are not going to change our people. They're not going to change our people. Think about it for a moment. Moses probably performed greater miracles than pff, any of us will ever do. I hadn't part of the Red Sea yet. I don't know about you. You know, the plagues, the, the Red Sea, the manna, by, you know, the, manna the cloud by, by day, the fire by night. Miracles all around Moses. But Moses came to a place in Exodus chapter 33 where he finally realized that miracles are not going to change people. 
Some people go, if I could just see somebody that I know is blind, and they, they, if I could just watch them see, I'd then believe. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. Miracles are not going to build your faith. The Bible does not say faith comes by miracles. It says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Your faith would not be any greater if you saw a bona fide miracle. If I saw a rust jump out of that chair, my faith in Jesus would not be any greater. It really wouldn't. I'd be stirred for a little while, but let me tell you something. After a while, it, it, it just wouldn't happen. And Moses, listen, Moses knew that. He, he saw, they saw miracle after miracle after miracle, but yet every time, it was, it was in a couple of days, it seemed like, at least reading through Scripture, the Israelite people were complaining and bellyaching again. Oh, what was us? Moses, Moses, Moses. And Moses came to a place in Exodus 33. He said, God, I don't need any more miracles. Show me your glory. I need your glory. Glory. Glory will change people's lives. The presence of God will change people's lives. I'm hungry. I'm hungry for a change. I'm hungry for the power of God, for a demonstration of the power of God. Listen to me, church. I pray. I, you know, I'm kind of getting tickled because I was listening to Crabtree last night and then Dr. Brown today, and I'm thinking my message, I'm thinking, going, boy, God's setting us up for something. He's, you know, I pray that we leave here going, I'm not satisfied with you know, a little bit of speaking in tongues and this kind of you know, singing in the Spirit and da-da-da-da. I think it's time for us to see a real move of God. I don't know how to get it yet. I don't know how to get it yet, but let me tell you something. We're going to have to do something different than we have been doing because if what we have been doing would work, we'd have already seen it. And I challenge you, I challenge you to get hungry enough to change some things. And if you ever come across the key, call me up, please, okay? My extension is 233 at the church. Please tell me what you found out. But, amen. We need a supernatural move of God, amen? amen. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your word. I know that you are the God of the supernatural. And, Father, I ask that you would burn in us a hunger and a desire, Lord, to see God move in this day. I believe we're dealing with a generation that is ready for the supernatural. I ask that you make us ready. Lord, whatever we have to do, Lord, I pray that I would be willing to drink of the cup of pain, that I would be willing, Lord, to drink of the cup that you drank of. Lord, that I'd be willing to pay the price. Lord, put us on a search. Make us hungry. Make us, stir us up, Lord, and change us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen.